In today's episode, we're gonna do a deep dive into how I use level two to time my entries and my exits while day trading. There is no question that being an expert at reading level two has made me a more profitable trader. The only question is how can I share with you and teach you to read the subtle signals that are telling me when to buy and when to sell when I see it on the tape? That's the goal for this class. Now, I'm gonna walk you through how I read level two, how I use it in my own trading to predict when a stock is gonna go up or when a stock is gonna go down. And I want you to start to implement the things you're learning in this class in your own trading. I can tell you that there's a learning curve to being able to really read the tape because it's like learning to read a brand new language. This is the language of the financial markets. But those who master this language are the ones who become profitable. As long as, in addition to the skill of reading the tape and identifying chart patterns, you also possess the elusive ability to maintain discipline. So if you think you have what it takes, let's go ahead and jump in. My name is Ross Cameron. I'm a full-time day trader, and I'm probably best known for turning an account with less than $600 into more than $10 million of verified and audited trading profits. While those results are not typical, they do put me in a unique position to share with you what is actually working in the market today. And I can tell you that I wouldn't have made that money if it weren't for mastering the art of reading the tape. Reading level two. So the way I think of level two is I think of it as the road ahead because what level two is showing is all of the open orders to buy or sell a stock. So it's not telling us what's already happened. It's telling us all the orders that are currently placed right now. And we use that information to try to make an educated guess of what's going to happen next. Now, stock charts are historical price action. A stock chart doesn't show level two. It doesn't show what the bid or the offer was. It doesn't show what the spreads were like. It just shows the historical price action, what's already happened. But this is important because this gives us context. So the way I think of it is sort of like driving a car. The stock charts are what I see in my rear view mirrors. I'm looking back to check the stock charts and I'm looking forward at the level two to try to predict what's coming next, which means most of the time when I'm driving, I'm looking through the window, not in my mirrors. I check the mirrors when I'm looking through the front window. Same with trading. Most of the time when I'm trading, I'm staring at the level two and I'm glancing at the stock charts. Now I've dedicated a lot of time in other episodes to teaching you how to read candlestick charts because that is an incredibly important skill to have but it is just one block in the foundation of becoming a successful trader and mastering tape reading and understanding how to visualize the level two is a critical block that you have to learn. And that's what we're gonna jump into right now. So we're gonna start with the basics and then we're gonna add detail as we go. This is the level two. On the left, we have the bid and on the right, we have the ask. On the bid, we have people that are bidding to buy the stock. So let's say the stock is trading at $5 you will have someone bidding at $5, and then they will have the number of shares they wanna buy, which could be, let's say 5,000. Now below this current best bidder at five will be someone else who wants to buy the stock. Usually it'll be one penny lower at like 499. Maybe they have another 5,000 shares. And then there might be someone at 498, and maybe there isn't someone next until 494. And it's 2,000 shares and 1,000 shares. These are all people that are bidding to buy the stock. Now they bid up to the lowest price seller. Now the lowest price seller in this case, we'll say is someone selling shares at 502 and they're selling 10,000 shares. And then let's say the next order is at 504 for let's say 7,000 shares and then 508 for another 3,000 shares. And then we could say 512 for another 5,000 shares. So at any time, when we look at a stock, these orders are moving. These are individual people who are placing orders. So at any time, this person could cancel their order. They could say, oh, I'm gonna cancel that order. I'm gonna take it away and that order's gone. And another trader could come in and say, oh, I actually, I wanna sell this stock at 503. I'm gonna sell 2,000 shares. So orders are constantly moving in and moving out on the level two. What I am looking at is 
a couple things. I'm looking at the spread between the best buyer and the lowest price seller. In this case, we have a two cent spread, $5 by 502. Now, any stock priced above $1 will trade with a minimum of a one cent spread. So 501 by 502 is the tightest the spread can be. Stocks are not quoted in fractions of a penny once they trade over a dollar. That's not true with stocks below a dollar. Stocks below a dollar will actually trade down to the one one hundredth of a penny, but I don't usually trade penny stocks. So we're going to focus this class on stocks that are over a dollar. So they're trading with a minimum spread of one penny. Okay. So with the minimum spread of one penny, uh, that's the minimum, but there's no maximum. You could have a spread. You could have a stock that's trading $5 by $6 a share with a $1 spread. But that's not very common. A two cent spread like this is much more common. Okay. So the first thing I look at is the spread. The reason I look at the spread is because this helps me understand the risk I would be taking if I take this trade. If I bought this stock right now, there's two ways I could buy. I could buy by posting an order on the bid to buy it at $5. But my order is just going to sit there like this other person. And in fact, because that person put their order there first, uh, my order won't get filled until theirs gets filled. So I'll be last in line if I place my order right now. Now I could uh, cut the spread by putting an order at 501 to buy 2000 shares, right? So now this moves the stock to a one cent spread. We'd have a tighter spread if I did that. Um, and that's, that's fine. Sometimes I'll do that. But if I really want to buy the stock and I want to get in right away, then the thing to do for me is to buy directly from this person who's selling shares at 502. Yes, I'm going to pay two cents more. I'm going to pay the spread amount more to get in immediately. But if I see a stock and I like the chart pattern, then I'm going to just buy right here from the lowest price seller, as long as the spread's not too big. Now, if we were in a situation where we had a 50 cent, 75 cent, or a dollar a share spread, that's going to be tough for me to take a trade on. I would say the maximum spread I'd prefer to trade would probably be 15 to 20 cents on a stock under $10 a share. But sometimes there'll be spreads bigger than that, and occasionally I will take those trades. Okay, so if I want to get in right now, that means I buy 25, let's say, for example, 2,500 shares, I buy from this seller. So if I did that, that order immediately is going to go to 7,500 shares. I'm going to have 2,500 shares at a 502 average. But let's just say, for instance, that I actually wanted to buy 15,000 shares. If I want to buy 15,000 shares and I placed an order to buy, and it's a market order, I would fill the full 10,000 at 502, another 2,000 at 503, and another 3,000 at 508, which means I would have 15,000 shares with an average cost of, you know, probably approximately, you know, 503. And, and, it, and this, in this case, may end up being a fraction of a penny that I get my average because I bought at different prices. The other way to do it would be to say, well, I'm going to place a limit order to buy. And so my limit order is going to be at the price of, let's say, 503. So if I did that, I would buy 15,000 shares at 503, and I would get the full 12,000 filled here. And then I would be on the bid at 503 with the remaining 3,000 shares. And on the offer here would be, well, the current 508 offer because these guys have been bought up. So now the, the stock would move up a little bit and my order would be sitting on the bid, which means I won't get filled unless someone comes and sells me shares at this price. Now that could happen, but I would have to be patient. My philosophy with trading is that when a stock is moving up, I want to get in. I want to participate in the move up and I'm not going to have time to wait and sit on the bid in hopes that someone will sell me shares. Because if a stock is moving quickly, people aren't selling. There's much more buying. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy from a seller on the offer. I'm going to buy from a seller on the ask. And as the stock moves up, when it comes time for me to take profit, you know what I'm going to do? So let's say the stock moves up. And, and let's just say for the sake of argument um, that, I'm, that I'm already in this stock. So we'll do 508, 510, 512, 515. Let's just say I'm already in the stock at 493. 
So what I could do is I could say, all right, the stock is moving up. It's got a lot of strength. I'm going to put my order to sell on the ask here. I'm going to sell my 15,000 shares at 507. And I don't mind being patient and waiting for someone to buy my shares when the market is strong. When the market is strong and we have an imbalance to the buy side, I'm happy to wait to let someone buy my shares, right? There's no problem with that. It's when a stock is squeezing up and you want to get in, sitting and waiting to get in on the bid, you'll never get filled. You'll miss your opportunity, all right? So when you want to get in, in my opinion, I'm going to buy on the ask. But when I'm getting out, if the stock is strong and I'm maybe just selling half my position or I'm taking some profit, I'm going to try to sell on the ask to get the best price. Okay, so in real time, the level two is constantly fluctuating. Orders are coming in, orders are getting canceled, and we ultimately see this very dynamic movement of where people are bidding and where people are, are asking or offering uh, shares to sell. Now, one of the things that this um, works in conjunction with is the time and sales. So the time and sales is a window right next to level two on most trading platforms that's going to show you every individual order that goes through the tape, that goes through the market. And this is called a tape because it, it, it sort of looks on a small piece of paper. It's about the size of scotch tape when it used to come out from a ticker tape machine in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. It would print on this little paper stream, this little roll of paper, and it would be printing the quotes. So today we have this same kind of visual tape, except of course it's digital on our computer screen. So what this is helping is this is showing every single order that goes through, but it's not in blue. These orders are going to go through and it, what would happen if we saw 503, 503, 507, and then we see 503, and then we see, you know, 507, et cetera. So the reason these are colored is green orders are orders that are occurring at the ask price. So of course the price is always moving up and down, but when we look back on the tape, when we see orders that are in green, it means at that moment they were occurring at the ask price. Orders in red are occurring at the bid price. When I say I wanna see green on the tape, what I wanna see, is a ton of orders here that are buy, 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 buy orders. When you see all this green on the tape, that communicates market sentiment. That tells you lots of people are buying this stock right now. People like it, all right? Now, if you see a huge burst of red, tons and tons and tons of red, that's gonna communicate that people are selling the stock and they don't like it. When it's mixed, you're seeing red and, and, and green sort of interchanged. That's usually when we're in a market that's a little bit more indifferent uh, if you see white or black, those are orders that are going through in between the spread, which can happen when an order gets matched, when there's a buyer and seller that are at the same time that are in between the, the bid and the offer. So orders between the spread are also sort of indifferent. They're not a strong sentiment to the buy side or to the sell side, but the lack of strong sentiment can be indicative of a possible reversal. So if we were trading a stock and let's just say, for instance, um, we look at, uh, we'll do th these candles here. We have the stock that's been making a nice move up. We've been seeing these big green candlesticks. And so at that time on the level two and on the tape, we were just seeing tons of green orders, you know, an occasional sell order, but tons of green orders. And then we kind of come up here to the top and we have a doji candle. This is a candle of indecision during this period of time, right? During this, let's say this is a one minute chart. During this one minute, these 60 seconds, we would see a mix of orders going through the tape that are red and green and that are black, that are in between the spread. And that would communicate on the level two, a degree of indecision. So what's interesting here is that people who are really good at reading the tape can actually create a stock chart in their mind based on the prices they've just seen. So let me describe how I do that. This is something I'll do a lot when a company does an initial public offering. When we first get an IPO, the stock is trading so quickly that sometimes the charts are lagging and struggling to keep up. This has sort of always been the case. So if a company IPOs at $55 a share, 
And the first order that I see go through is at 55. What typically happens is we'll have that first print. So I'll just draw this um, here just to begin with. Usually what will happen is you'll have the first print at uh, $55 and usually it's a, there's some selling. And then you might see, you know, 50, uh, 54, 90, 54, sorry, 54, 50. It starts to drop down and then maybe all the way down to uh, 54, 0, 0. And then it goes 53, 50, all right? And then all of a sudden you see green of 53, 55. The second I see that green, this is when I'm buying. I let it sell. And then once I see the green, I'm buying, and I remember the high was 55. So I'm in now, I'm gonna buy this now. So I would say buy at you know 53, 60 approximately. And then my max loss on this trade is the low that I had seen on the tape, 53.50. And now I wanna see it rip back up and usually this will happen really fast. All of a sudden we see 54.25 and then we see 55 and 56 and 57 and 58 and boom, I'm taking profit. Now what that would look like on a chart is initial candle going red, pulling back, and then maybe a bottom, and then this whip back up. And it's kind of like a red to green move. It's just this incredible surge back up. And the only things I really need to keep track of is what was the high, what was the low, right? Right down here. And if I can remember those two prices, then essentially I can visualize a chart. I know it hit a high, we pulled down to this level, and now I'm looking for that red to green move where we go from the low and whip back up. So in the older days, before you had stock charts, you would have the ticker tape machine producing the quotes. And so people would actually manually on some graph paper, plot out the highs and the lows. And they would do this for all the stocks that they were watching for active traders and investors. Now today, of course, we have stock charts, so we don't have to do that. But I think it's as a good exercise worth trying to see whether or not you could visualize a chart just based on the level two. I'll do this all the time with halt resumptions. I'll do it when a stock has got breaking news. I'm staring at the level two. And when I'm staring at the level two, there's always a question of what exactly are you looking at? So we've got the bid, we've got the ask right here. So in the case, well, it doesn't really matter. So let's just do a new example. So we'll put a stock at $7 and then we'll do 715. And then here is gonna be the time and sales, time and sales. So this is where we're gonna see every individual order that goes through. So what I'm doing is I've got my two eyeballs and they are both looking right here. So they're looking right here at the ask price. I glance at the time and sales and in my peripheral vision, I see the green because they're right next to each other. And when I see that green, I know other people are buying. So at that moment, if I like this stock, because you know, let's just say it had a nice uh, pattern, one of the chart patterns that we talk about, I know it's very close to an apex point, And I'm perhaps thinking, well, if I get in here at 715, my stop is seven, psychological support at the whole dollar. Then I'm gonna press the buy button. I don't use market orders, I use limit orders. But the type of limit order I use, I use uh, a 10 cent offset. So that's a, supposed to be what, whatever, 10 cents, 10 cent offset. So the 10 cent offset means I'll place my order at uh, actually 725. So 725. So if I want to buy 10,000 shares, that means I'm willing, if there's only 3,000 shares for sale here at 715, I'll buy those and I'll buy the ones at 717 and I'll buy the ones at 7, you know, 19 and 724. But if I can't fill my full order up to 725, I'm not going to allow it to fill any higher than that. Let's just say, you know, there was only between $7 and, and $8, there was only 5,000 shares of sell orders. That's not likely, but let's just say, for instance, there was a stock that that was the case. If you press the 10,000 or 20,000 share order, all of a sudden, you're just filling higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And then you're going to realize, whoa, I'm in 10,000 shares, but I'm in at $7.75 or something like that. That's way too high with my stop at 
Now I'm risking 7,000 bucks. So that's not gonna work. So I allow slippage. Slippage is, is the difference between the price you wanna get in at and what you actually fill at, but within reason. So 10 cent offset to buy and 10 cent offset to sell when I sell on the bid. But most of the time I try to sell on the offer. So in this case, I'm gonna buy at 715. I wanna see the stock go up to 725, 735, 745. And then I'm gonna be looking at the price action as it comes up to the next area of resistance. Now we know that on most uh, stocks we'll have psychological resistance up around 750. So psychological resistance can be visualized in the form of let's say a 20,000 share sell order right at that psychological level. And then, uh, so let's say this starts to squeeze up to 745, um, oops, 745, 745 on the bid, 750 on the offer. Now, if we have a big stream of buyers, this will go from 20 and then it'll go 18, 17, 16, 15. This buyer is getting bought up. When I see this happen, usually once it breaks like 10,000 shares and it's down to 987, I will add right here because this seller is being bought up. And once we break this psychological area, as long as the bid moves up to 750, and it will as almost definitely when the stock goes up, when it breaks that 750 level, it's gonna go up to like 765 or something like that. As long as the bid stays at 750, now this is my new stop. Now that's even better when the buyer at 750 is like 10,000 shares. When you see a big buyer there at 750, then it's like, okay, now I know I could buy 10,000 shares at 765. And if I need to turn around and sell it at 750, I can. Now, it is important to note that there is something uh, called order spoofing that some people will use. Now, you're not allowed to do it. It's illegal. And if your broker catches you doing it, they will ban your account, close your account and ban it. But there are some people that will do it, unfortunately. And what that means is a spoof is when you place an order right here, but it's a f it, well, it's not a fake order, it's a real order, but you're, gonna, you're planning to cancel it before your order gets filled. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to convince people that there's support here, but you're going to just pull that order away as soon as someone tries to sell into it. So that does happen, but because it's illegal, it doesn't happen a lot. So... For the most part, when I see orders on the level two, I take them at face value that they're real orders. Uh, however, if I see a stock does have someone spoofing orders, then I usually won't trade that stock for the rest of the day because I'll realize, okay, I can't trust the level two on this one because there's someone doing something sketchy. All right, so when I see this big buyer on the bid, the only time I look at the bid really is to check two things, the spread, which in this case is 15 cents, and how many shares are sitting at the bid price. Now, sometimes you look at the bid and you'll see it's 750, and then the next bid is 749, 748, and you're like, okay, it's this is a very, there's a lot of bid support. Other times you'll look at the bid and you'll see it's 750, then it's 714, and then it's like 689. And you're like, okay, if this 750 breaks, it's going back to 714. If 714 breaks, it's going back to 689. So this is a stock that I'd be a little bit more careful on, but what I might see is something similar on the other side, 760, 795, eight, uh, sorry, 835, right? And then let's say 872 or something like that. And you're like, wow, okay. If this stock breaks this 750 level, we're not seeing a lot of resistance on it all the way up to nine bucks. So what's kind of interesting is that your what you see on level two could be taken sort of out of context of what's happening on the stock chart because you might look at the stock chart and you see well wait a second we have the 200 ema exponential moving average at exactly you know 735 so or, or maybe let's say it's at 750 it's at 750 now sometimes at 850 Sometimes at 850, right at that 200 EMA, you'll see another big seller. And you're like, okay, someone recognizes that. So, so sometimes the level two will very directly correspond to areas of support or resistance on the chart. But there are other times where, for whatever reason, 
It does not. And so you cannot use level two in complete isolation to using a stock chart. It's not a replacement for a stock chart. They're supposed to be used in conjunction and they complement each other. Ultimately, you want to avoid analysis paralysis, but at the same time, the, the information you get from the charts is historical context and you get the visual of the current chart pattern, which it can be a buy signal. So if you have a strong buy signal forming on a current chart pattern, and then you pull up the level two and you see, all right, on the level two, we've got some good bid support. We don't have any big, big sellers. Now it's like you've checked sort of your multiple um, levels of information and they both check out. And then we would say we have confirmation from multiple sources. We have confirmation from the stock chart. And we have confirmation from the level two. There are times where I'll see a stock chart that looks awesome, but the level two is garbage. Let me pull up my um, monitor here and I'll show you uh, level two in uh, sort of in, in this visual form. Okay, so this is the level two uh, right here of the stock. It's down 4.9% and you have the bid on the left and the ask on the right. In this case, we've got a, a spread of 12 cents, 460 by 472. And you can see at 460 that we have a buyer of 3,500 shares. 35, it's always in, in the increment, you add two zeros. So one is 100, 10 is 1,000, 100 is 10,000. So on this stock right now, if you happen to like the chart, which, well, I don't, because this chart's boring, but if you did like the chart, then you would look at the level two and probably see, uh, it's got a 12 cent spread, not a lot of volume, probably can't trade it. GOTU just hit our scanners here. Now this looks very different. We have a very tight spread, 67 by 68. And what's probably worth noting on this is, wait a second, why, what's up, what's up with the colors? So I'm gonna just freeze this screen for one second. So right in this area here, the reason we have like seven rows of green is because 65, 765 is the first tier of price. It's the best buyer. And the reason we only have four at 66 is because there's, well, there's only four at the best price on the sell side. So the first or the first level of the market, the first depth of the market is the first level and it's green. So the best buyer and the best seller, the, the highest price buyer and the lowest price seller. Now the second is red and the third is yellow and then so on and so forth. So I find this to be extremely helpful in my trading because I'm able to clearly visualize there are more buyers than sellers or there are more sellers than buyers. In this moment, there's more buyers right now and there's an 8,000 share buyer that just came up. So as you see this here for a moment, you're actually seeing that how fluid it is, how it's actually moving. And this little window here is our time and sales. So there's some orders in green and some orders in red. Now we haven't pulled up the chart yet. So we don't know, again, we were looking at this in absence of a stock chart, but now we see a chart and we see a stock that, well, to be honest, is fairly extended. It's up 29%, it's been moving higher. Now the float on this is nearly 100 million shares. For those that have watched my class on the best stocks to trade, you know that this is not the type of stock I would typically be day trading, uh, slightly higher float. These are more likely to be a grinder, move a little bit more slowly. Now, certainly it's been steady, you know, slow and steady, but it's been moving a bit more slowly. And it has a very um, large stack of buyers and sellers at almost any given time. This degree of buyers and sellers is most likely um, created by algorithmic trading. High frequency trading algorithms subscribe to market data. They're subscribing to the market data and in real time, as they see orders coming in, they are moving their own orders. So if they see a big buy order come in, they can actually try to cut in front of that buy order to get in first. Now, this is a practice that is very common in the high frequency trading world. It's not something retail traders like you and I can do. And so generally when I see a stock that I think has a higher level of algorithmic trading, I will avoid it because I'll know that there's market makers cutting in front of my orders to make money off of me. And that kind of means the pie of profit is being split 
in more ways. And that means less profit for me. And the market maker is always going to win because they're use these sophisticated algorithms. So trying to trade against them is like playing chess against a computer. It's very difficult. And so generally speaking, I know that most stocks that have higher floats will have higher degrees of algorithmic trading because these are stocks that are less volatile and less volatile means they're safer for a computer system to be trading. So if we looked at stock like Bank of America, it's it's very much the same. Ford, motor company, very much the same. But if, then if we looked at a stock like HOLO, this one, very different, right? Look at how different those are. Or you look at BMR. This one, well, maybe this one's a little in between. It's it's a little heavier on the bid side, lighter on the ask side. Maybe that's indicating that there's more buyers on this and, and fewer sellers. WETG, again, a little bit of a thinner one. But you look at HOLO and you've got 12 cents spread and you can see how quickly this stock can and, and could potentially move up. It's obviously very volatile. So, and if you looked at the chart, you that would just reaffirm uh, what you're thinking there. This is a stock that has a history of making huge moves. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the things that I look for that really help give me an indicator that I should be buying or selling. Okay, so I see this stock um, hit my scans, let's just say. So it hits my stock scanners, like SOND, it's hitting the scans. Okay, so my first order of business is I see the stock, I look at the volume, I look at the float, how much is it up today? Now this one isn't really standing out in any meaningful way, we could look at FTEL. I don't know that this one will stand out in any meaningful way either. It initially doesn't just looking at the scans. So we'll switch back to GOTU just for instance, because this one was at least moving quite a bit. Okay, so GOTU, um, it's got higher float, but we'll pull up the level two. So I pull up the chart, I pull up the level two, and then at this point, I'm looking at the bid, I'm looking at the ask, I'm checking the spread, how big is the spread? And, and immediately in this case, I would say it's too thickly traded. This isn't probably even going to move five cents a share. It's just it's in too thick of a range. It's it's probably not going to work well. So I, this one I would probably say no. But if HOLO popped up on my on my um, scans and it's squeezing up, I would look at this and think, okay, if we get through the 30s, we could get up to 1080. So then I would look at the chart and say, is that a realistic probability? And if it is, then I'm going to look for green on the tape. So as soon as I see that green on the tape, that's gonna tell me that other people like this stock too, and they're buying it. So that tells me I'm not alone in my theory that this is a stock worth worth looking at. So I press the buy button and let's say I get in at you know 765. From the moment I get in, I pretty much wanna see the stock go up. If I'm right on my entry, I'm getting in at 765, my stop is at 750, which is the half dollar. That means in this case, I'm risking 15 cents a share, Profit target is 30 cents for a two to one ratio. So target's 95 cents. And that makes sense coming up to the half dollar whole dollar of eight, which could be psychological resistance. So as we see green on the tape, we'll see the price start to move up. So it goes 765, and then it's gonna be 785, and then that gets bought up, and then it becomes 88, and then that gets bought up, and it becomes 98, for instance. Now, if there's a 50,000 share seller here, I'm gonna realize, okay, someone is selling a lot of shares here at eight. I'm not gonna to wait to hope that breaks. I'm gonna go ahead and take some profit. And unfortunately, because there's a really big sell order here, although I could put an order underneath that and cut the spread, I could put the order at 797, people are still gonna see that there's a huge sell order here at 98 for 50,000 shares. So I might as well, in this case, not even try to sell on the offer I'll look at the bid and I'll say, well, let's see what the bid's at. And if the bid is at like 88, I'll probably just sell on the bid. Yes, I'm going to get 10 cents less, but my theory is that because we have this really big seller up here at 98, 98, 790, I don't know why I'm writing backwards, 798, that other people are going to see that they're going to get scared off and they're going to start selling. And so what we're probably going to start seeing is some red on the tape. Some red's gonna start taking over on the tape. And then as that happens, more people are gonna sell and it's gonna go, the seller's gonna take out 788 and then it's gonna go to 778. And then that's gonna get sold into and then it's gonna go 765 and then back to 740, seven, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll hold at 750, maybe down at 750, we'll see a 20,000 share buyer. 
And if that's the case, then I might say there's some psychological support down here. So in that scenario, I might go ahead and try to buy at 755 as a dip trade with a stop at 750. Now it's a five cent stop. And if this bounces even just back up to 775, hey, that's great. That's a 20 cent, that's 20 cent profit. That's a four to one risk reward ratio. So I would take that dip trade as it comes back up. So when I'm doing dip trades like that, a lot of times they are based on what I'm seeing on the level two. Now, for me, dip trades will also be, no doubt, based on uh, the price action I'm seeing on the chart. So SPRC is one I traded uh, earlier this morning. It's had this kind of squeeze here. Um, and when it first started to pop up, I'll actually show you on the 10 second chart. Um, I like the 10 second chart because it can be helpful for visualizing what happened uh, in a very small window of time. Okay, so the stock pops up right here to a high of um, 475. It dips down and then it pops up to a high of 512. It dips down right here to 463. And then I saw some green on the tape. And I say, you know what, I'm gonna punch it. I bought 2000 shares, stop is at the low of this candle. So why did I punch it? Well, I saw on the tape, in this case, the price was around um, five, four, it was around 485, I think. And the previous low had been 463, but the bid had already started to come up to about 475. So I was like, I could get in right here with a 20 cent stop at about 465. All right, so now I'm risking 20 cents. Profit target, 40 cents. And what ended up happening on this trade is it breaks 485, it goes to 499 and then immediately goes up to 510. So now I'm immediately up 25 cents a share. And then it goes to 530, 540, 550. And all of a sudden, look at this right here. We hit a high 527 and then it squeezes right here up to 580 and it hit a high of 620. So this ended up being a really nice move. And although I didn't make a ton on it because the volume was kind of light and it was early in the day, it was a nice start. So this wouldn't have happened, this trade, if I hadn't looked at the level two and seen, okay, I can get in this with like basically a 15, 20 cent stop. The spreads are relatively tight. We sold off and now we're seeing green on the tape. So this is kind of where the rubber meets the road in the sense that level two is gonna, you know, you're gonna look at my trade sometimes. You're gonna look at a chart and be like, oh man, I don't see where you got in there. And one of the problems is that the chart doesn't show you what the spreads were. You know, the chart doesn't show you what the level two looked like. The chart is just showing you the prices that actually went through. It doesn't show you that there was a 50,000 share order, you know, here or there. So when you're looking just at the chart, yes, you can look back and you can see, oh, I got in there, you know, I got in right down here and I sold a little here and then maybe I added back here and sold a little here and added back here and sold a little here and sold a little here. You know, you'd see the buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. But you, but without seeing level two, it, it could be hard to understand exactly why I pressed the buy and sell button. So what I can tell you is that the actual pressing of the buy and sell button is based on what I see on the tape. So when I get in a trade, the first thing I wanna see, if I've, got, if I've made the decision to press the buy button, which would have been based on an analysis of the spread, how thin or thick the, the level two is with other buyers. If it's very crowded, I'm probably not gonna trade it. If it's too thin and we have like a 75 cent spread, I also probably won't trade it. So the sweet spot is that it looks like it has the potential to move 35, 40 cents a share. You know, that would be nice. I'm not gonna trade something that can only go up five cents a share. That's not enough. That's not enough profit to justify the risk. So I wanna see that it could make a, big, a bit of a move. So if I've done my due diligence there, and I've said, okay, I'm gonna execute the trade I'm in. From that point, what I wanna see is green on the tape because the green on the tape confirms that I was right. I had the right idea and other buyers see it too and they like it and the price should be moving up. You could see green on the tape, but the price is not moving up. That would happen if there's a really big seller on the level two. So I wanna see the price moving up. I wanna see green on the tape and I wanna see it approach its next level of resistance, which most frequently will be at the next half dollar or the next whole dollar. So from 750 to eight, from 850 to nine, you know, nine, nine to 950, et cetera. 
is, right? So as it's moving up every 50 cents, I expect to see a little bit of resistance. Now, sometimes when stocks get really strong, they start going full dollars a share and only hitting resistance at the dollar mark, which is impressive when that happens. But I expect a little resistance at half dollars and, and that's okay. That doesn't bother me. Okay, so that's what I wanna see. If right after getting into a trade, I see a huge sell order for a million shares pop up, I'm just gonna get out. I'm not even gonna try selling the ask. I'm just gonna sell in the bid and get out. If momentum just sort of you know, goes away, I don't see any green on the tape. There's some red or just some white, then I'm gonna think I better get out because I, I timed it wrong. I expected to see volume and we're not seeing it. I expected to see the stock go higher and it's not. And those are kind of my two indicators. Or a th third, if I see a burst of selling. If as soon as I get in, I see a burst of selling, then I'm like, whoa, someone else is selling. I, I better just get out. So if I see those three things, those are my indicators to bail. And I see those on the tape. I'm not gonna really see those on the chart. By the time they're reflected in a chart in a candlestick that has a tall upper candle wick or is a doji, it's already happened. So I need to be able to see it happening in real time. And that's what I'm gonna visualize on the actual level two. I'm gonna see that on the time in sales. On the time in sales and the level two. I'm gonna see it in both places. Now, as I mentioned before, for my trading, I'm using limit orders as my order type. Um, and I'm using offsets 10 cents above the ask, uh, five, 10 cents below the bid, depending on the price of the stock. If you make the offset too big, you can get orders rejected if you're trading penny stocks. Five cents on a you know 50 cent stock is 10%. So that's could be too big of an order offset. You could get the order rejected by your broker. But for most stocks, five to 10 cents works well for me. It allows a little bit of slippage uh, for entries and exits, but not too much. Market orders don't work pre-market, so I won't use them. And in terms of stop orders, one of the problems is that stop orders go into what's called level three market data. We don't get that access as retail traders, but the big dogs do. So they see where all of your stop orders are. So if they see a bunch of people all have stop orders at the same price, they could bring the stock down to that price, get you all stopped out, and then it comes right back up. They basically buy your shares. So you have to be a little bit careful with stop orders. You cannot use them at all pre-market, but you can use them during regular trading hours if you'd like. The fact is, if you're the type of trader who's using level two, you're most likely trading quickly. Your average hold time is less than five minutes. You're getting in, you're getting out. You're getting back in, you're getting back out. You're a very active trader. The reason that I trade like that is because for me, I guess that's where I sort of found my edge. I felt like it's very hard to predict what a stock is gonna do six months from now. It's hard to predict what it's gonna do six weeks from now. It's hard to predict what it's gonna do a day from now. But what's gonna do 15 minutes from now, that starts to become more manageable. Now there's a limit to how much you can make in 15 minutes. You can't put $100 million into a stock and then take it back out in five minutes or 10 minutes. But you can move in and out with $10,000, $100,000, couple hundred thousand, sometimes a million. I certainly did that during GameStop uh, and that was fine. And so for me, moving in and out quickly it is easy with smaller positions. And that's the area where I feel like I have an edge because I can predict based on what I see on the level two, when I'm seeing on a chart, what a stock is going to do. Ultimately, the traders who are able to predict the future the best will be the ones who make the most money. So this episode on reading level two is gonna go very nicely with my other episodes on how to find the strongest stocks, how to pick stocks, and how to read uh, chart patterns. All right, so make sure you keep studying, keep learning. And if you found this episode at all helpful, I hope you hit the thumbs up and I hope you subscribe to the channel so you can stay tuned for my next upload, which is coming real soon.